welcome to Addicted to Murder. This is Courtney, licensed professional counselor with over a decade of experience. And this is Trisha. And Courtney, did you know that you have a fear of adder cops? A fear of adder cops? I assume that means spiders. It does. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that term before? No, but I know... Your fears? I do know my fears. <laughs> and that's the main one. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, mm -hmm. A-T-T-E-R-C-O-P. Adder oh. cop. Interesting. And if anyone ever wonders where I'm getting my words, it's from the lovely game Boulder Dash. Oh, so should, many good words. I know, and I shouldn't have given it away, Like, but that is where I get them on the daily or on the weekly. It's a good resource. Yeah. Um, it's from like the 1980 version. Even better. So I don't know if some of these words have been removed from whatever dictionary they got them out of, but hey, whatevs. Do they remove words from dictionaries or do they so. just add new ones? I thought that they did both. I don't actually know. But, well, man, yeah, I don't know either. I haven't looked into it, but I feel like they they do both. Because um, there's some old, old English words that probably are not, I don't know. I'm no phoneticist. I don't even know if that's the proper word. Phonetics? Yeah. Linguists? Yeah, I don't know. One of those things. One of those things. Yeah. Um, I wish I spoke more languages. Me I too. I tried. And, you know, I I watch stuff on social media um, about how people think, you know, Americans are kind of dumb because they typically speak just the English. And that's fair. However, there's not a big need for us to speak other languages because most Americans don't leave the country. That's true. And part of the reason for that is that the country's so big that, you know, um, it's hard enough to get to all the states within the country. And traveling internationally is extremely expensive. So expensive. I, I know very few people, myself included, though, um, who have traveled internationally. And they'd love to. They just, it's just, a, it's a huge expenditure. Right, Absolutely. So, and, you know, our closest countries to us are Canada, which speak English. And then, you know, like Quebec and a few places there do speak French. But Mexico, which speaks Spanish, but we all typically were required to take Spanish in, in school. So we do all know a little bit of Spanish. We're not, most people I know aren't fluent, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. I'd say most of us probably know a little bit yeah, of Spanish. Yeah, a little bit but... of Spanish. We did take it in high school. It was always a required thing. College, yeah. it's usually a required thing, at least for a couple years. I mean, I took French in high school and college. Yeah, I, you usually could pick a language. It's true. Uh, I did have one required semester of Spanish in eighth grade, though. See, there you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I took it in middle school, too. Senora Rosa. Mm. She would always yell at me for chewing gum. Uh. Patricia. That's what she'd call me. <laughs> so, anyways, I just... it it. Uh, it doesn't like bug me because whatever people can think what they want. But sometimes I'm like, hey, we're a, the country is so big. It's it's almost bigger than like Western or, you know, Western Europe. Right. <laughs> so, we have states the size of countries. Exactly. If I if Washington spoke a different language, I'm sure us Oregonians would know it. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Same so, with California. Yeah, and exactly. So anyhow, I don't know why I was going off on that, but it just kind of bugged me a little bit. I get that. But. Oh, well, there are a lot of things that um, people feel about Americans that may be true, but I don't think that that one's really a fair one. I'd agree with that. So, anyways, off of that weird little soapbox I went on, I'm I'm a little bit grumpy today. I don't know why, Courtney. I'm sorry if I'm not my regular vivacious self. That's all right. It's been a long year so far. And it's still flipping raining. It is. It's ridiculously raining right now. I mean, it is April in Oregon. Right. It's supposed to rain. It's true. That's how we don't have terrible fires in the summer. Except for lately. Well, that's because it didn't rain. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> or what will happen is it will rain so much that it causes so much undergrowth that when the summer does come, there's so much to, uh, like tinder to burn that it makes it even worse. So whatever. I'm going to stop being negative. I'm going to move on to our question. All right, let's do it. Which is sort of um, a segue from what we were just talking about, because my question is, Courtney, what is your favorite thing about uh, spring? Ooh. Um, that's a good question. I'd say my favorite thing about spring is... 
Oh, do I have to pick just one? No. Okay. Because I really There's like... No rules here. I really like that the days get longer. Okay, yeah. And so I'm no longer, like, going to and leaving work mm-hmm. in the dark. Yeah. So I really like that. True. And I really just love seeing everything, like, blooming. Mm-hmm. And I love baby animals. Yes. Speaking of that, I went to the winery yesterday. I wasn't... I didn't drink anything because I'm still, like, fasting from that. Good for you. Um, but the winery that I went to has tons of baby animals right now because they're also a working farm. And they had a baby calf, a couple baby goats, um, a baby horse. I guess it's called a foal. Yes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And stuff. Um, Lots of ducks were running around. Like, it was so cute. I I posted a picture of a baby goat on top of the mama goat yesterday on my Instagram, on on our Instagram page. Oh, that's where that was from. Yeah, that was at the winery down the road. Very so, cool. I do also love that. My favorite thing, though, is probably the smell of the plum and cherry trees. Uh, and they yeah. all turn pink. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, they make me sneeze, but they also smell so good. I was going to say they're the main cause of my allergies in spring, so I can't really smell them very well. Yeah. Because I'm always sniffly and sneezing. But You know, I think I must have got COVID at some point in the past year because my sense of smell is definitely um, downgraded. I used to be a super sniffer, and now Chris will smell things that I can't. Huh. And it's the only thing I can think of because that was one of the main things about COVID was you kind of – I still smell stuff, but I'm not smelling what he's smelling, and I used to smell much like more intensely than him, if that tracks. Interesting. <laughs> so anyways, I can still smell those flowers, though. They're strong. They are strong. That's true. Okay. On to the case, brand new case today, and I'm just going to preface that we are using the book, A New Kind of Monster, The Secret Life and Chilling Crimes of Colonel Russell Williams by Timothy Appleby. Um, So yeah, this was about a colonel who eventually became a colonel, and he was up north in Canada. And Courtney, I kind of feel that he's a little different from, you know, others that we've looked at because he claims and the evidence seems to support that he did not become, quote, evil until later in life. You know, he was hardworking, intelligent, and he was very respectable. And he actually climbed to a pretty high rank in the Canadian military before his fall. Do you agree with this, Courtney? You know, from the outside, based on the information that we have, it does look like that. But I would be really surprised if he wasn't at least harboring violent thoughts for much longer. Mm -hmm. You know, we've certainly seen other killers who don't act on their fantasies until later in life. But many had some clear warning signs, which we didn't necessarily see externally happening here. Yeah, he's kind of one of those tight-lipped persons. So Very military. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so we'll get started. So David Russell Williams, who would go by Russ or Russell, was born March 7th, 1963 in England. His mother was Christine Noni, and his father was Cedric Cedric David Williams, and he would go by David. The family soon moved to Chalk River, Ontario, where his father got a job at Chalk River Laboratories as a metallurgist. I probably said that wrong, but it's a kind of metal engineer. You said that right. I did? Yay. Sometimes my phonetic skills work for me. He had a younger brother named Harvey. So the family was living in a nice town and was making a good living. There was no poverty or anything like that occurring, you know, with this family. Some who interacted with the Williams clan, you know, claimed that David was loud and he was often insulting towards his wife in public places. And she was often often busy doing social activities at the country club and would leave her children home a lot or alone a lot. Eventually, the family would become friends with another family. And that was Jerry and Marilyn Sovka. Sovka, what do you think? Sovka? Sovka, who had three children of their own. Jerry was an MIT-educated nuclear physicist, and he was outgoing, and he was thought of as a ladies' man. Don't know much about his wife. It looks like all of the insults that David would make to Christine eventually got her got to her enough to file for divorce. And based on the book we're using, David seemed to be very chauvinistic. He actually sounds like he was maybe a narcissist. I don't know. 
Regardless, she claimed that the grounds for divorce were um, based on adultery. So she claimed that David was having an affair with none other than Marilyn Sovka. Christine got the boys and moved out. Jerry also filed for divorce. So Marilyn's husband, Jerry, also filed for divorce, citing, citing adultery you know, for Marilyn because Marilyn was apparently sleeping with um, David. And Marilyn kept those children. Okay, so four months after Christine and David's divorce went through, she remarried. Guess to who? Well, you already know. That's right, Jerry Sovka. Sovka. <laughs> so <laughs> basically, they kind of like swap partners, yeah. right? These two families kind of swap partners. So Jerry and Christine would stay married for 30 years. Uh, David and uh, Marilyn. I guess we're together for a little while, but they ended up fizzling out and David ended up remarrying another woman who was also married at the time that he met her, but she left her husband for him. So whatever these, these people, these people maybe shouldn't be married. I don't know. Uh, they then moved to Germany before calling it quits. Okay, Courtney, let's talk about this weird ass situation and what kind of effect it could have on a young child, especially one that grew up in a household where the biological father belittles the mother so i'm talking about prior to the divorce also so there are several factors to look at here you know growing up with a father who you know belittles your mother you know it can certainly impact the way that a young boy learns to think about and treat women it can contribute to the child believing that their mother truly is less than and doesn't deserve to be respected um, and in the long run can be generalized to sort of all women. So all women don't deserve respect or, you know, deserve to be belittled or put down. Also, it's kind of unlikely that David would be so critical of Christine, but not turn any of that criticism on Russell or his brother. And then on the other side of the situation with the affairs, um, and I just kind of want to point out in the book, they kind of made it seem like this whole little sciencey community up in Ontario was just full of a bunch of swingers mm -hmm. and that this was happening all over town. Mm -hmm. um, so not necessarily scandalous, but it's definitely something that like the, the boys probably picked up on because children mm -hmm. are much more perceptive than we as adults often give them credit for. But if they, you know, are aware and believe that, oh, these affairs, that's what broke mom and dad up, mm -hmm. then it can definitely color their views on marriage or relationships and their ability to really trust other people. So you think that most likely David was also criticizing the kids, even though that wasn't really said in the book? Just, I would guess that okay. would be true. Um, you know, if he really was a narcissist, mm -hmm. um, like they suggest... You wouldn't be just a narcissist to one person. Gotcha. Okay. The book claims that when Russell was old enough, he pretty much cut off all communication with his mother because of the whole thing. And Courtney, I don't really get it. From all appearances, it looks as though, you know, dad was mean to mom. Dad had an affair and that caused a divorce. Yes, it was awful fast how quickly mom got remarried. But why do you think all the blame was focused on mom in this situation? It doesn't even look like dad, you know, really tried to get custody of the kids at all. And I've seen this before where, like, the son blames the mom. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's yes. kind of a common thing. So can you give shed a little light on why that might be? Yeah. So it's possible that Russell kind of internalized some of that misogyny that he heard from his dad towards his mom and held her more responsible. Like, for example, if he was constantly hearing dad put mom down, tell her that she's stupid, she's the problem, Russell could have sort of internalized that and started to believe that himself about his mother, that mm. she was the cause of problems. Gotcha. Um, it also sounds like probably, you know, both parents had affairs. Mm -hmm. I would seriously doubt that mom was not Right. involved with because they, they with got Jerry. married awfully quickly <laughs> yeah before um so really neither party was innocent in this situation and as we'll get into a little bit later um there were probably other things related to his relationship with his mom that led to his decision to no longer contact her 
Russell, his brother Harvey, and his mom and his new stepdad moved again when he was seven. Russell is pretty close-lipped about his family, so we don't know a whole about uh, excuse me a whole bunch about what was going on, how he was coping at this time. But they did move a lot, many times over the years. Courtney, I assume kids who constantly move have a different mindset than those that stay put. Is there anything you want to say about this in regard to who Russell would become in the future? So frequent moves can contribute to a sense of chaos and inconsistency, and that can have a pretty serious impact on children. You know, children who are moving around frequently may struggle to make lasting relationships, either because of lagging social skills or just kind of choosing not to try to make close friends because they feel like everything would be temporary anyway. So why put in the effort? It can also lead you know, to anxiety and uncertainty, you know, never knowing how long you're going to be somewhere um, or what school you're going to be going to next or, you know, when your entire life might just be uprooted and changed. Um, And so as we see with Russell, as he grows up, you know, kids often try to cope with this anxiety and uncertainty by becoming very rigid and trying to control any parts of their lives that they can. That makes sense. An acquaintance of the family had this to say regarding how the family appeared in public. In regards to the parents, quote, They were both kind of cool to me. They never spoke to me, ever. My impression was that the mother was very controlling, not what you'd call a loving lady. Everything seemed very ice cold, a very strict household. Nothing ever seemed spontaneous. But Russell and Harvey were nice guys. They seemed to be close, always doing things together. Russell was always polite. He would wave at me. Everything seemed kind of planned for them, and it was obvious they had money. I never went in their house, but whenever I saw them outside, they always looked neat. End quote. So to all outward appearances, Russell was a polite kid, maybe a bit shy. He could come off as snobbish, but all in all, there was nothing that was revealed from his childhood that would indicate what kind of person he would become. He had a paper route. He was dependable. He was not into drugs or alcohol. He was very organized and he was smart. Courtney, do you have anything you want to add? Just that I think we can probably infer from this information that Russell's mom, and possibly stepdad too, but mom for sure, um, had very high expectations for him, and there was likely very little room for emotions or failure in that household. In 1978, Russ was was a jazz trumpeter and was in the senior band. In college, however, it was like a switch was flipped, and the music he once loved to create and listen no longer held any interest to him. He was also an athlete. He worked very hard and was very disciplined to maintain a pristine physique. Russell did not have many relationships with women. He may have been just too shy. There were a couple of girls here and there, but not many uh, for how reportedly good-looking and hardworking he was. In 1978, the whole family moved to South Korea. He stayed there for about a year and learned martial arts, but he didn't love it there. Apparently, people assumed he was American and were mean to him. He was Canadian. So after that year, he and his brother were sent back to Canada to a boarding school while his mom and stepfather stayed in South Korea. A quote per the book regarding rest at the school. Quote, he didn't have a lot of friends, zero social interaction. He pretty much played the trumpet and stuck to himself. He completely lacked any social skills whatsoever. I just can't recall him having a single person he spent a lot of time with in typical conversations. If there were subjects he had a knowledge of, it was like he was above discussing them with you. He was creepy. Courtney, thoughts on any type of diagnosis at this point? There really is not a whole lot to go on in terms of a clear diagnosis for Russell at this age. But based on what we do know, I wouldn't be surprised if he had some kind of anxiety disorder particularly around like social interactions and perfectionism. So if I was going to maybe put a provisional diagnosis out there, like maybe social phobia, which is, you know, characterized by worry about and avoidance of social interactions, particularly due to a fear of being judged negatively and rejected. Moving around often, including going to different countries um, and being in, placed in cultures where the social mores were unknown, could have certainly contributed to that. Yeah. In 1982, Russell graduated and enrolled at the University of Toronto on the Scarborough campus. He would graduate four years later with a medium-level honors degree. 
At this time in his life, he changed his last name back to Williams. So I don't think that I said that, but um, he had changed it to Sovka for his stepdad, but now he's going back to his biological dad's last name. At this time, he seemed to come out of his shell a bit more as well. He became a prankster at the house he shared with other young men, and he was described as being fun and having a, quote, great sense of humor. One of his roommates, who liked, who like everyone else in Russell's life, was absolutely flabbergasted about what would transpire later on, had this to say. Quote, he had a conscience. He always had a conscience. That's what really leaves me stunned about this whole thing. Russ always had this strong sense of right and wrong, end quote. So this is perplexing if it's true. I don't know. What do you think, Courtney? Do you think he had a conscience? Maybe he doesn't become antisocial. There are those out there that kill and maim who feel remorse about it, I suppose. Yeah, I do think that Russell has a conscience and experienced feelings like guilt and remorse. Perhaps that is why he was able to contain his fantasies and behaviors for so long. You know, if he believed that these urges were wrong, he actively tried to control them. Yeah, he succeeded for quite a while, as he far did. as we know. So, um, Or maybe it was a chick that changed all that, you know? It, isn't it always a mother or an unrequited love that maybe flipped that switch? Or Any, a combination of the two. Yeah. Anyhow, I guess that he felt pretty hard um, in college for a lady. They stayed together for two years, but apparently it seemed to others that it was a pretty one-sided relationship. Basically, he would do anything for her, but she seemed somewhat indifferent to him. She dumped him, and it apparently was one of the only times he had ever been seen crying. She was very controlling, is what was you know the common perception, always telling him what to do, and he would do what he could to please her, but it sounds a little similar to the way his mother ran the household, maybe. He was very depressed after the breakup. He kind of stalked her for a while, to the point where she told him to back off. He didn't really date after that, and he was inconsolable for a long time. Do you have anything to say about me comparing her to the mom? I think that you're right on with that. Okay. I mean, that was just sort of like... My thought. (laughs) She probably treated him a little bit like his mom. Right. And I mean, there is definitely some weight to the the idea that we tend to marry a version of our opposite sex parent. You know, women marry their dad and Mm -hmm. men marry their mom and... It must be we could get into attachment theory and talk about how we look for partners that we feel like we could help heal or change so that we could then be healed from our parental wounds. Mm. But that could be its own episode. Its own um, video spotlight. Maybe we will do that Because we haven't point. done one for a while. Yeah, but not today. Yeah. After college, Russ got a few odd jobs here and there, trying to work out what to do with his life. He applied and got accepted to the RCMP, Rock. Royal Canadian Mountain Police, but he really wanted to be in the Air Force. Apparently, the movie Top Gun had a huge impact on him, so he actually turned down the police job in hopes that the Air Force would accept him. Kind of crazy, right? I mean, how many of these guys have we seen try to get a job with the police and join the military as a backup? And here we have it the other way around. Uh, It's kind of weird. Anyway, he was eventually accepted into the Canadian Air Force, and he went through his boot camp training and also started to train as a pilot. He did very well in pilot training. He was noted for how quickly he grasped concepts and he could master an aircraft quickly. He was thought of as a very nice, very helpful person and would often help the newer recruits with their training. Three years later, he was a fully-fledged military pilot. He had earned his wings. He then became an instructor for pilots, which was not a common thing, but because he was so analytical, he was very suited to it. And, you know, paired with his kindness, he just worked well with the newer recruits. He started as a lieutenant, but soon became a captain. He also got married at this time, which surprised a lot of people. Later on, many would speculate that it was a marriage of convenience and some of, you know, a little more like affection rather than love was what was between them. Her name was Mary Elizabeth Harriman, and she was five years older than him. She worked as a nutritionist. Courtney, anything you'd like to add? Just so for an intelligent, focused, and perfectionistic type of person, there really are few jobs more suited than being in the military, and particularly a job like a pilot where there is just no room for error. So it doesn't surprise me that Russell was sort of drawn to this profession. And as for the the marriage piece, we really don't know that much about 
Russell's marriage, as both he nor Mary have talked publicly about it. But they were together for a long time, so mm-hmm. it clearly worked for them. Yeah. During his time as an instructor, bits and pieces of his personality that some categorized as narcissism started to emerge. He loved to take pictures of himself and video himself flying and a few other things that made him come off as arrogant and cocky. Russell moved around a bit, both geographically and in his career. He became a major in 1999 and lieutenant colonel in 2004. And in 2005, he flew the Queen and Prince Philip around Canada. Williams also would take over some covert operations during this time of his career, including running an airbase in the Mideast. Because of his service, he won the Southwest Asia Service Medal and Canadian Forces Decoration, which he was given for 12 years of service. And it was about this time, September 2007, that Lieutenant Colonel Russell Williams later admitted to a side project. His admission of guilt is backed up by the 25 timestamp photos that Russ took and uploaded to his computer. 125 miles away from his base in Ottawa, Russell had a cottage in the county, uh, in the country on Cozy Cove Lane in the small town of Tweed. A family in the area was acquainted with with Russ and his wife, and Russ played with their kids sometimes. He would take them tubing in his boat. They were a boy and a girl, and the girl was 12 years old. She appears to have been Russell's first target. He broke into their home at least twice when they were out and spent hours inside, primarily in the young girl's bedroom. He searched the girl's underwear drawer and would remove, you know, his clothes and posed with only the girl's underwear on his penis. He would ejaculate and take pictures of this. He would leave, but he would take items. Um, This one time he took six pieces of undergarments. He would return to the same house within a month and did the same thing, taking 20 photos of himself and took another 22 items, or sorry, took another 22 more the next day. He may have stayed the night or come back again, so we're not sure on that, but he was in and out of the house a lot, took a lot of photos in that 24-hour period. He took other photos of himself that day somewhere outside, but he was still naked and wearing the stolen underwear. He would not break into this particular house again for eight months. So this seemed to be the start of the path that he was not able to control. Courtney, do the photos of himself indicate narcissism? What do you think we, you know, we see mentally from Russell right now? The self-portraits of himself wearing girls and women's lingerie are indicative of a few possible things. Narcissism is one of them in that, you know, he may have considered himself the, quote, perfect model. Or maybe he thought of those pictures as a celebration of his own cleverness at being able to pull off these crimes. It also speaks strongly to a sexual fetish for underwear or transvestic fetishism, which is being sexually aroused by wearing the underwear or lingerie of the opposite gender. Looking at the photos also could be a way for Russell to relive those experiences for the purpose of later sexual gratification. So I guess this just occurred to me. Um, You can be a transvestite as a woman wearing men's, I guess, boxer shorts? And getting turned on by it? Yep. Oh. It goes both ways. Okay. The second place he broke into was in the same neighborhood. He broke in twice and stole underwear and a swimsuit. This would be the only time that someone would come home while he was inside. They saw a tall man in a hoodie and they chased him out. They did not catch him and they didn't notice anything missing. So they didn't report it to the police for a few days. This close call must have scared Russ because he didn't do this again for several months. He repeated the same pattern over and over again when he would do it, though. Quote, intrusions into homes while the owners were out, protracted masturbation sessions where he cavorted and posed for the camera with his underwear trophies and then left of, and then the, and then the theft of those items, often a dozen or more stuffed into bags he had brought with him before he slunk off into the night. He would break into dozens of houses and do the same ritual. He did it at night when no one was home. Oftentimes, no one even knew they had been burgled. In fact, he admitted to breaking into 48 homes altogether and many times targeting underage females. He would also have illegal contraband found on his computer when he was eventually arrested of underage females. Eventually, Russell would admit that he stole 1,400 pieces of clothing, mostly all lingerie. He would take thousands of photos of himself with this contraband. In May 2008, he widened his net to the Fallingbrook 
area in Orleans. He had to be bolder in this neighborhood because the people here kept their doors locked much more than in the rural area of Tweed, where he had been targeting. It was a riskier place to burgle, and he was also becoming more greedy with what he stole. In one instance, he robbed a house that had two 11-year-old twin daughters who lived with their mother, and he took every single piece of underwear in the house. Obviously, that got noticed. In fact, 15 of the 25 houses he hit in this neighborhood filed a police report. Although some couldn't be positive about what was stolen, but they could tell someone had been in their house. At this point in time, the police knew that something was going on, and they officially launched an investigation. They put undercovers on the streets watching for prowlers. Um, Courtney, anything you want to say? You know, it really seems like at this point in his life, Russell's ability to stay in control of his urges and emotions is starting to falter. He's becoming more and more obsessed with his sexual fantasies and stealing and the photo shoots are becoming almost a compulsion. And of course, we'll talk about that more in the next episode. Yeah. um, When I was reading this, it hit home a little bit just because, you know, but um, I have been robbed or I've had my house broken into and I don't know what was taken. I would notice if someone took all of my underwear, but they might have taken some. I, you know, I couldn't tell. But the feeling of, um, I want to say creepiness, but it was like beyond that, like violation. It just it was very violating knowing that someone had been in my house rummaging around and taking things, um, that this is really freaking disturbing to me that someone can do this and did a lot, did it a lot without people even knowing. Right. I mean, shit. That's why I got my alarm system. It's a great that. reason to have an alarm yeah. system. It, it's kind of, I, I, after, you know, this wasn't that long ago. I'm surprised that not very many of the people, maybe he knew if they had an alarm system. I don't know. But I didn't read anything about alarm systems going off on any of these 45 houses he hit. So I would imagine that he, being as smart as he was, knew how to pick a house. Yeah. And knew how to case it before he did. going in. He did learn how to pick locks and all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't know that we went over that, but he learned a lot of stuff in his military training and other trainings that he did and right. um, stuff like that. So anyways, we're going to wrap up there today. And yes. I guess we will just uh, see you next Tuesday. Bye. Bye.